papers, the week in review from the conservative perspective. That's right, we're going to give you the news that News24 and others don't like to talk about. Uh, this has been an unbelievable week filled with all sorts of action and drama, excitement and uh, adventures. So I'm going to have to be quite... Um, uh, I can uh, do the mouse with my right hand and read with my uh, left eye. Um, so I'm going to have to be short and to the point. Uh, let's run through it quickly in no particular order. The Santon terrorist attack warning. What a drama. Didn't that go through social media like nobody's business? Uh, it turns out that apparently the best advice, this is according to uh, a couple of security experts, independent security experts, whose uh, interviews and um, uh, interviews and uh, opinions I've, I've read, it was apparently, allegedly, supposedly, according to them, an, a, a planned attack on the gay pride parade that is going to happen in, in um, uh, Santon over this weekend, today being uh, Friday the 28th of October. I always forget to mention that. It's now about, uh, what is it going on for today? It's 20 past five. <coughs> <coughs> Silva Ramaphosa was uh, quite offended. Um, <coughs> how the thing came out was that the United States Embassy <coughs> in South Africa warned U.S. citizens that the USA had received through all of its intelligence uh, channels monitoring telephone calls and WhatsApp groups and you name it, traffic across the world picked up that there was meant to be a terrorist attack. They didn't know precisely when. They knew it would be over this weekend. They didn't know precisely where, but that it would be in Santon. And they didn't know what the target was or who the perpetrators were. Um, and they made an announcement about all of that. And Cyril Ramaphosa was most unhappy that uh, he hadn't been told first. And then Zizi Gotwa, the uh, Deputy Minister of State Security, also issued a statement saying that uh, uh, it wasn't very nice the way the USA handled the matter, not going to them first. But then there was a counter-suggestion amongst the security experts, or from one of them, that in fact some kind of attempt had been made to reach the right people in South Africa. The telephones weren't answered, so to speak. They weren't in the office, or whatever the case may be, but that the USA decided we're going to issue this alert and these guys can get back to us whenever it suits them to do so. Um, so who knows what the truth is, but the long and the short of it is that apparently uh, a Muslim, a Muslim ISIS-connected Al-Qaeda connected, Daesh connected, ISIL connected, ISIS, ISIL and Daesh are roughly the same thing. I'm just being a little bit silly. But somebody affiliated to one of those prominent, one or more of those prominent uh, uh, Muslim terrorist organizations was going to pull their own stunt in South Africa against the gays. And, um, yeah, let's see if it happens. You never know. You never know. Maybe they already planted whatever they were, you know, it maybe it was a bomb. Perhaps a drive-by shooting, in which case I suppose they've been deterred. They wouldn't take that chance now. The, um, every manner of, of police and security force is going to be present at the gay parade in Santon over the weekend. What's next? Do you remember the, uh, the ESCOM CEO, Marcella Coco, who referred to himself as Engineer Coco, Engineer Coco to you. In other words, I'm not one of these, uh, these uh, fly-by-night blacks uh, uh, pretending to, uh, to, to be capable, qualified of 
uh, designing a building or whatever. I mean, that was the clear, clear, clear implication at the time. I'm sure it's very offensive to many people now that I should dare to mention it, but they have short memories. At the time, it was well understood that he was making the point that he's a real qualified engineer and that he's now at the helm of ESCOM and everything's going to be fine. Well, he, his wife, his stepdaughters, and a whole bunch of other people, 17 in total, he was arrested in a group of eight, but there are, are another nine that were arrested. So in total, 17 people, including engineer Coco to you, have been arrested <laughs> pertaining to 2,000 million rands worth of irregular expenditure on the Kusile pro project. And they were given 300,000 rand bail and it was explained that uh, the bail was set quite high because there's a flight risk. <clears throat> Look, as many of you know, I, in my past life, as it were, wrote many, many budgets for the African National Congress to steal, to steal money. I don't talk about them because I prefer not to get bumped off. I've never described them in detail to Mr. Miller or anybody else. Um, <clears throat> since I've been doing this work for Saitlanders, let it suffice to say, on 2,000 million rand, I can assure you from experience that at least 50% of that, in other words, a billion rand, 2,000 million, 2 billion in, in American English, which sadly we are all obliged to speak now. A thousand million of it, a billion, I guarantee you a billion went into the pockets of the perpetrators. Apparently, the Special Investigation Unit and the Hawks and the uh, uh, Directorate of, uh, of Prosecutions um, have been working on this from 2016. So, with five year, six years of investigation under the belt, presumably they've got everybody. Divide a billion rand by, call it 20 people, for the sake of a nice, easy round number. That's 50 million rand each. And presumably, the main actors would have taken the lion's share. The small and yana guys would have got 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10 million rand. And the big wigs would have got 100, 150, 200. But we've set the bail real high so that he doesn't run away. We are using 300,000 to, to deter him from running away with 100 million and living happily ever after in who knows where. <clears throat> Goodness gracious me. <clears throat> oh dear. <clears throat> Enough said. Vladimir Putin gave a very long speech yesterday, Thursday, the 27th of October, at the Valdai Club meeting. The Valdai Club <coughs> is sort of a, a Russia-driven, kind of equivalent to Davos WEF, not to say that it's necessarily sinister or nefarious, but it plays that kind of role. In other words, it is a meeting of elite people to discuss economics and finance and related matters in, in the world. And um, he uh, didn't say anything worth me telling you now because you've heard it all before. His speech was very long and he then held a very long question and answer session. Um, I've watched two versions of it. The one was three hours, 35 minutes long and the other was maybe two hours, two and a half hours, something like two hours, 20, roughly. Um, I didn't take notes. I just dived into the thing. And um, I can tell you that it was long, but not especially creative 
or original or revealing. He mentioned things that he's mentioned many times previously. But the value of it lies in that very reiterate, reiteration. In the fact that he's once again saying, these are our values, this is what we believe, that's how we're going to conduct ourselves, and these will be the hopeful consequences of us going about things in this way. And, excuse my language, the West can go and take a flying leap. And so far, of course, he's been nothing but correct in every single thing that he's ever said. So, uh, it looks as if they are sticking to their guns, they know the route that they're walking, and they seem very confident of walking that route successfully. Uh, it was reported this week that Russia recently conducted live fire nuclear missile exercises over its three nuclear triad platforms under Vladimir Putin's supervision. The three nuclear triad platforms traditionally are land, sea and air. Now land could be, can be broken down into static and mobile and mobile broken down into lorry and, and railway. And I think that that's a better way of thinking of it myself personally. But in simple terms, they talk about triads, land-based, sea-based, air-based. Air is uh, big airplanes, either dropping bombs or firing missiles with nuclear warheads. The uh, famous uh, Tu-160, Tu-22M and Tu-95 Bear aircraft do that. And then the nuclear submarines and then, of course, missile silos and trains with uh, these big and so they they they, they tested um, video has come out of these live fire exercises they tested um, um, uh, missiles on um, on trucks you know and you see the truck park and within I mean it's unbelievable those missiles are so big the I'm talking now about intercontinental ballistic missiles the very big ones much bigger than the uh, cruise missiles that are more Agile and nimble and fly a lot faster, but are, are less, uh, are smaller in size. And it was quite spectacular to see that arm because the missile is obviously horizontal on the back of the truck wing being transported, but it has to be lifted up, it has to be erect uh, for firing. And I couldn't get over how quickly they, that, that arm. That hydraulic system, I'm assuming it's hydraulic, I don't know. How, how rapidly that hydraulic system lifts that arm with carrying the missile into place. Zoop into the vertical position. Just phenomenal. It was quite a thing to watch. Right here, what's next? Allegations are during the rounds that Russia is suffering a computer processor silicon chip shortage for their modern military equipment. That all of the supply chain shortages and chip problems and trouble in Taiwan and sanctions and this, that, the next thing are leaving Russia short of uh, 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 computer processor. You know, they have computer processors in their modern tanks, in their modern armored vehicles, infantry fighting vehicles, armored fighting vehicles, planes, trains, you name it. <clears throat> the airplanes, obviously, and in the missiles themselves, and in the radars, and the control systems, and the modern radios, and the drones, and the control... Um, but sadly, I'm going to stick my neck out here and say that assumes that Vladimir Putin and all of his advisors are so stupid that they didn't make provision for this in 2000 and... Let's say four when, I think it was four, no, six, when Viktor Yanukovych's uh, election was annulled in 2013 and 2014 when Viktor Yanukovych, on the second attempt, became president of Ukraine and was then kicked out. Or 2014 when the Donbass said, please can we come back to Russia? Or when the shelling started in the Donbass in 2000 and late 2014. Or in all of the time since then that they've been planning for this massive thing, they negligently forgot to order computer chips. It's idiotic. Rashid Sanuk, 
Rashid Zenuk. Rashid Zenuk assumed the office of His Britannic Majesty's Prime Minister on Tuesday, 25 October 2022. Joe Biden congratulated Rishi Sunak by calling him Rashid Sanuk. There's no helping the Americans anymore. They're done for. Big event. First non-ethnically uh, British person to be Prime Minister of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's, it's reminiscent of the fall of Rome. The fall of Rome is traditionally attributed to the year 476 AD. And um, the reason being, it turns out, I mean, everybody talks about loss of control of the empire, the, all of these things, but I discovered something absolutely fascinating. The person who coined the phrase the call of Rome was a writer who was bewailing, bemoaning the fact that for the first time ever, Rome's emperor <coughs> or consul or king, because there was first the kingdom of Rome, then there was the Republic of Rome, and only then the Roman Empire. And for the first time ever, Rome would be ruled by a non-Roman, uh, a German guy's name I can't remember. So by extrapolation of that logic, perhaps this is now the fall of the United Kingdom. A shortage of diesel is emerging in the USA. It has been reported today, there are two very, very good reports that have come out, excuse me, um, one by Tucker Carlson, one by Jackson Hinkle, there's another one by Clayton Morris of Redacted, and there are numerous others, but it's suddenly become a big, big issue, although it's been coming a long time. St. Lunders has been talking about it for a lot, lo a lot longer than anybody else. Trust me, what my WhatsApp groups, uh, Mr. Miller's group and the sponsors, Mr. Miller and the sponsors group, and uh, the St. Lunders National Leaders Group uh, are testimony to that. But here's the interesting thing. They reported today, and all of them refer back to a, a, an authoritative article of a week ago that's kind of emerged in recent days. And they all regurgitate, all except Jackson Hinkle, regurgitate what it says in the article. There are only 25 days left. 25 days left. It's an emergency. It's a disaster. It's a crisis. They forget that seven days have passed, there are now 18, perhaps 17 days of diesel fuel supply left in the United States of America. Only once before has the supply been this uh, little, going back decades, and that, at that time, there were three and a half billion people in the world. Now, the United States of America and the world are not one and the same thing. But it just gives you a sense of perspective. Seven billion people fighting over whatever's available in the world. <clears throat> when in one country, the shortage pertains or, 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 or is parallel to a period when there were only three, three and a half billion people. So there's some kind of... It's a bit of a false comparison, but it gives some kind of perspective. Okie dokie, Xi Jinping, the Premier of China, Chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, and by extension, as the African National Congress does it here in South Africa, the Chairman of the, um, of the African National Congress is automatically, assuming that the African National Congress has won the election, the President of the Republic of South Africa. <coughs> had his predecessor, Hu Jintao, Xi Jinping has been in power for 10 years, and he goes into his 11th now, <coughs> Hu Jintao was in power for the decade prior to Xi Jinping uh, assuming power, from 2002 to 2012. He's an elderly man now. He was bodily removed, picked up reluctantly 
<coughs> from the 20th National Con Congress of the Chinese Communist Party. The National Congress of the Chinese uh, Communist Party is, the, is very similar to the ANC's elective conferences, such as the one that's going to be held in December of this year here in South Africa for the ANC, in the sense that it doesn't happen every year. So the 20th National Congress actually uh, 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 is the 20th in 100 years. <clears throat> and um, the reason that uh, thoughtful people are giving for Hu Jintao's removal during this Congress in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing, in front of thousands of Communist Party members, the who's who of the Chinese Communist Party, <clears throat> is that he is reluctant to invade Taiwan, and he has been in certain meetings, in committee meetings, I suppose you could say, at the highest level of the Chinese Communist Party, been urging rapprochement, reconciliation, if you like, with the West. The renowned economist Magnus Haystack revealed in an interview with the Center for Risk Analysis yesterday that, or very early this morning, published, I mean, presumably it was conducted yesterday, uh, that foreign capital is fleeing the JSC like never before, and that the Johannesburg Stock Exchange has lost almost one trillion rand since Cyril Ramaphosa assumed power. So since everybody's hero, St. Andrews was the only organization I never heard, Center for Risk Analysis, Institute for Race Relations, <clears throat> Avia Beer, nobody, nobody, nobody publicly took the stance that we did when Cyril Ramaphosa was elected, saying in repeatedly in numerous published videos, this is not a good thing. Cyril Ramaphosa is not a force for good, and you are going to discover it the hard way. <clears throat> Tabo Becky, now famously, said on a video that came out this week that he will not campaign, campaign for the ANC because it retains assassins on its books. And he gave a, an example to illustrate his outrageous claim, as some people might have it, <clears throat> that was quite a persuasive example. He was able to quote, you know, not chapter and verse, but I'll use the expression. He was able to quote in some detail um, how it's known that in certain places, in certain municipalities, assassins, hitmen, are retained on the book. They earn a salary every month. So that they have retained so that their services are retained for the ANC to knock off anybody they need to at a moment's notice. Do you believe this? Do you believe this stuff? It was announced this week that the Public Service uh, Servants, PSA, Public Servants Association of South Africa, is likely to go on strike next Wednesday, I believe, the 3rd of November. <coughs> Would it be the 3rd? October 28, 29, 30, 31, 1, 2. The 2nd, the 2nd of November. Wednesday, the 2nd of November. Let's see what happens. If, if they do go on strike and they, they stick to it, it could cause a, a lot of trouble. There, a revelation came out this week of two dirty bombs produced and manufactured by the Ukraine and or NATO and deployed certainly with the blessing of NATO. It can't have been otherwise. That is to say bombs using conventional explosives but with uh, uh, radioactive material on them. A dirty bomb can have um, uh, chemical or, nu uh, or biological material uh, that also constitutes a, a dirty bomb but in this case it was apparently Radioactive, radiological material, dirty, dirty, filthy uh, nuclear material, atomic material. <clears throat> and the Russians apparently intercepted one in late February, but it only came out now, and another one last week. Then it came out 
some very interesting reports. Very, very interesting. In fact, I, I hear that the one guy who's broken this story, well substantiated, had somebody in the interview with him talking, um, that apparently Ukraine has been using chemical uh, shells on the battlefield, on the front line. I can't give you any more information than that. I don't know whether it's bomb shells or cannon shells, whether they're <coughs> 60 millimeter mortar or 155 millimeter howitzer or 500 kg uh, gravity bombs. I don't know. But apparently soldiers on the front line, Russian soldiers, have been complaining in some numbers that after certain shells fall, so we presume, we presume that it's artillery, after certain shells fall, a, a strange colored smoke is emitted in the explosion and that that smoke is uh, uh, very harmful, very, it causes a great deal of pain and discomfort in the lungs, head, body, joints, stomach, all sorts, lethal stuff. We'll see what comes of that. Iran is conducting very large military exercises on the border with Azerbaijan. Now you might be thinking to yourself, oh Simon, come on, it's Friday evening, this has been dragging on for 26 minutes now. You're telling us about Azerbaijan? That's not red hot news for Saitlanders. Well, it may turn out to be one of the biggest news stories that we ever hear. Turn out to be, not yet, but turn out to be. So, it's hot off the presses, breaking news. Why is it such a potentially such a big uh, thing? Because <coughs> in certain very uh, academic journals, there are discussions being held about uh, Iran and Russia's desire to forge a nexus to connect, to connect to one another physically, geographically, in the Caucasus between the Black Sea, <coughs> excuse me, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. The Black Sea being a, a not an inland sea, it has a connection through the Dardanelles to the Mediterranean, which connects to the Atlantic Ocean. But the Caspian Sea is an inland sea, but very large, huge, huge. It has, uh, the Russians have an enormous navy on the Caspian Sea, and so do the Iranis. But it's inland sea. And um, the, the Caucasus, the famous Caucasus, lies there. That is, the, that is the, the where East and West meets. And the people west of the Caucasus are you and me, Caucasians. The people east are the, um, I'm trying to think, the, the, the four traditional, I can't think of, traditionally the, the four races of the world in scientific terms, that's a long time back now, we're Caucasians, Mongoloids, Negroids, and uh, it escapes me. But anyway, there you go. If Russia and Iran connect physically to strengthen one another in anticipation of a potential World War III, and in so doing, smash Azerbaijan to pieces, it will be one of the biggest stories that you ever hear in your life. That alone will cause World War III because it will be effectively the Shiite. You know, the, the Yanks and the, the... If somebody corrected my English in the, in the past couple of days and it has offended me no end, the, the cheek of it, which is not to say I'm not high and mighty, just as my doctor's not high and mighty, but if I started correcting his script, you can bet your bottom dollar he would not be pleased about it. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Look, all I'm saying is that um, Shiite is a misnomer. It's Shiite. It means the friends of Ali. It means those Muslims who remain loyal to Ali and who say that Ali should have taken over. He should have inherited the line, the unbroken line, well, which is now broken, but what was then the unbroken line from the, from the Prophet Muhammad. And Sunni Islam. Sunni is named for the Sunnahs, which are not 
the, the Quran, but they are expositions, let's call it, on the Quran. So that's Sunni, Sunni versus Shia. It will be World War Three. Just that alone, I can tell you. And last but not least, oh, we've got a little bit more here. Elon Musk has taken over Twitter and promptly fired the three or four, uh, the, the chief financial officer, the chief legal officer, and the chief executive officer, the CEO, and one other guy who I don't know, um, from, from Twitter. It's going to be an absolute bloodbath. As a matter of interest to you, did you know that today, as of today, Meta, Facebook, has lost $730 billion, $730 billion in value since uh, the, the, the point in 2020-21 when it uh, became a trillion dollar company. It was a trillion dollar company for a brief honeymoon period. And since then has lost 730, 700, did I say 720? 730 billion dollars. Most wonderful, gratifying news, although very, very sad for the, the investors who've lost all of that money. Shame. Shortage of fuel in South Africa. It looks like there may be problems ahead. It looks like we may be in for a bit of a high jump. Um, I'm going to read to you from, just briefly, a uh, article here, if I can just find it. I thought that I had left it open on my computer. Oh, here, here we go. <coughs> but I apparently hadn't. Right, so this comes from the 16th of October. But, but, it's now um, uh, coming out that... It, what was written on the 16th of October is now being followed up. For instance, there's a guy called Peter Morgan, who is the chairman of the Fuel <coughs> Retailers Association or Fuel Wholesalers Association, people who sell fuel um, to the market that follows on from this. So South Africa is a week away from a food, petrol and deeper load shedding crisis that was on the 16th of October. And it goes on to talk about how this is a consequence of various things, but most especially this, the, the South African Transport and Allied Workers Union and the, national, the United National Transport Union, UNTU, <coughs> strike which ended uh, last week. However, it seems as if this thing that we appeared to miss because the strike was resolved hasn't been entirely resolved, and this man, Peter Morgan, is now warning us that, in fact, there could be big para on the horizon. And I'm not going to labor this point too much. This is, a, this is a week in review. We don't have to uh, dig down into too great detail. Let it suffice to say, ladies and gentlemen, Saitland is hear this and hear it well. Dire warnings are being issued. And I put it to you that if anybody is to heed them, it is to be Saitlanders. Yesterday, the medium-term budget policy speech, um, sometimes known as the mini-budget, in Parliament revealed that taxpayers will pay 200 billion rand in bailouts for ESCOM, Sanral, Transnet, and some, uh, some others. That was revealed by the Minister of Finance, the new Minister of, or the fairly recent Minister of Finance, Enoch Godongwana. 200 billion. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> and, and, that the eToll system has been scrapped. Not so quickly. The debt associated with the eToll system is still going to be paid by the taxpayer through the government and the municipalities of Johannesburg. So that would be Johannesburg and then West Rand, I don't know the name of that municipality, and East Rand, uh, what is it called? I know I should know it. <clears throat> Those three municipalities 
and the government are going to split the debt 50-50. So with each municipality, the government is going in 50-50. So you will still be paying, thank you very much. Your, your willingness is appreciated. The grant, the famous COVID grant, the grant that was extended to 7 million people uh, in 2020, almost three years ago because it was fairly early in 2020, let's call it two and a half years ago, and which was then extended to 2021, then two, if I've got it right, has now been extended to 2023, but probably 2024, if I understand correctly. So that's 30 billion rand per annum, for which again, they say thank you to you, dear viewer. Seven million people will receive a grant from the government, a social grant that was originally predicated upon the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Last but not least, Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commissioner or the, the President of the European Union, I'm sorry, I, <coughs> has clandestinely done deals with injections manufacturers to purchase 10 injections for every man woman and child 10 doses for every single eu citizen <clears throat> 71 billion euros worth of contracts for 4.6 billion covid-19 vaccine doses which suggests well i mean it does suggest it's simple arithmetic that the population of the European Union's 27 member states is 460 million people. That's quite interesting. All I can say, guys, is that since it has happened after COVID, one might reasonably expect that they have an idea that there is another pandemic coming. And I have the ominous feeling that it is going to be a far greater persecution than the previous one. I think that this one's going to be real. A real and severe illness. And people are going to beg on their knees for the vaccination. Ah, that's speculative. Anyway, everybody, thank you very much for watching St. Lunders, The Week in Review for Friday, the 28th of October, 2022. May the Lord bless and keep you for the week that lies ahead of you. You begin with the weekend now. Wonderful, wonderful time. But until I see you again in the intervening seven days, for the, uh, until I see you again for the, the next uh, week in review, may you have a blessed, blessed week. Uh, thank you very much. Goodbye. Cheerio.